Genesis chapter 47. We'll wrap up this chapter today. We've been working our way through the life of Joseph. What's interesting, of course, is, is that the life, you know, no, no man is an island. And uh, the study is on the life of Joseph, and yet so much of this study really has focused on Joseph's family as well. If we were to look at your life, and if we were to break down your life moment by moment and story by story, we could not just look at you all by yourself in an isolated case. We'd have to look at the people that influenced you and the people that impacted you and those that you were raised with and raised by and, and, uh, and, and who you had a close relationship with. And such is the story here in the life of Joseph. We spent so much time talking about his brothers and about his father. And we'll look at his father again today. The Bible says in Genesis 47 and verse 27, and Israel, which is just another name for Jacob, God had named him Israel, which means prince with God. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 140 and seven years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. In the year 1846, former president John Quincy Adams suffered a debilitating stroke. Although he eventually returned to Congress the following year, his health was clearly fading. Daniel Webster described his last meeting with former President Adams. Someone, he said, a friend of his, came in and made particular inquiry of his health. Adams answered, I inhabit a weak, frail, decayed tenement, battered by the winds and broken in upon by the storms. And from all I can learn, the landlord does not intend to repair. You know, the day is coming in which there will be no more repairs made on your earthly house. In other words, the vessel that you currently inhabit that's been given to you by God. Of course, we understand the landlord in <clears throat> the case of former President Adams is God himself. And, and President Adams is looking at his future and he's understanding his life and he's saying, you know, as far as I can tell, God has no in plans, he has no intentions to repair this body and to heal me so that I can go on. Our text reveals that Jacob or Israel came to the time, the Bible says, when he must die. You know, all of us will eventually get there someday. You may not feel like you're in that position just yet, but each of us are racing toward the day in which we as well must die. The timing of our death will be different. The circumstances of our, of our death will be different, but the truth remains that in this room, every one of us have an appointment with death. In life, things bear a certain importance or significance, but in death, the things that oftentimes brought so much joy and so much delight, they, they, no, longer, they no longer satisfy, they no longer meet the needs when we're staring death in the face. The text tells us that Jacob or, or, or Israel, that he dwelt in the land of Egypt and that he prospered there exceedingly, according to verse number 27. That just simply means that Jacob was a man of significant, extraordinary wealth and that his wealth and his possessions, his, uh, his portfolio, we might say, it continued its upward climb for the 17 years that he lived in the land of Egypt. But I have to tell you that money and possessions are nice. But when you must die, they fade in importance. As the time drew near for Jacob to draw his last breath, we don't find him asking to meet with his banker. 
We don't find him wanting a, another review of his financial reports or uh, his, uh, his financial stakes. Um, let me see what I have. Let me find delight in these things. Uh, we, we don't see him uh, looking to view all of his real estate holdings and to, and, to, and to get another report on how much cattle I have and how much wealth I have. No, those things became quite irrelevant in that particular moment. Job said these words in Job 121, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. Job, Job acknowledged that he came out into this world with nothing and when he died, he would leave with nothing that he had accumulated down here. The possessions are great while you're living, but they, they, they lose their importance, they lose their significance when you must die. It's no longer as important as maybe it was when you were full of life and that was what you were living for. The Bible also tells us that not only had Jacob enjoyed great prosperity, but that he had also lived a very long life. He had lived for 147 years when it came time for him to die. You know, we all want to live a long life. I, I think most of us want to, uh, to, to live as long as we possibly can. And, and we even said a few weeks ago in this series that sort of the world, because they do not have hope beyond the grave, they do not have hope beyond this life, the world views those who live the longest as the winners. And those who perhaps live life, a short life, they're viewed almost as unfortunate losers. You know, the reality is the length of our lives is determined by the sovereign will of God. The Bible says in Job 14, 5, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. God has a number of months that he has determined that you will live here on this earth. You could perhaps look back over your life and you can count up all the months that you've lived and you might wonder, I wonder how many months I have left. None of us know, but God knows. God has a specific number of months in mind. God has set some bounds for you with your life. The day that you were born, the day that you will die. None of us know the day that we're going to die, but God knows the day that you're going to die. God has predetermined all of these things. They're within the purview of the sovereign will of God. The Bible describes death as an appointment. The Bible says in Job 7, 1, is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? Are not his days also like the days of an hireling? The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You know, when we woke up on Friday morning, we had heard all week about a storm that was coming, and schools made, you know, made their plans in advance. Most of them here in this area canceled on, on, uh, on, on, on Thursday night, and uh, I got out of bed on Friday morning. My kids were all staying home. They were excited, and I started getting dressed. They looked at me and said, Dad, where are you going? I said, I'm going to work. But Dad, it's a snow day, and I had to remind them, you know, that's only for kids in school, you know? The rest of us, we have to go to work. But perhaps some of you, you looked outside your window and you thought about what you had scheduled to do that, that day, and perhaps if you were able to, you may have made a few phone calls, and you may have said, hey, listen, yeah, I'm going to need to reschedule. I just have to tell you that there's one appointment that you and I can't reschedule. You can't pick up the phone on a snow day and call God and say, hey, you know, Lord, it's, the weather's really bad. Can we pick another day for me to go home? It doesn't work that way. But mark it down. Listen, the Bible, the Bible talks about the day in which you must die, the day in which I must die as an appointment. And it's not one that we can wiggle out of. It's not one that we can cancel. No matter how long a person lives, it cannot prevent them from succumbing to death. Jacob lived 147 years, and yet when it was his time to go, he went. The Bible says in Acts 17, 26, and hath made, speaking of God, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And so we see over and over again throughout Scripture this idea that God, by his sovereign will and his sovereign plan, determines when you'll be born. He determines 
when you'll die. It's fascinating to me then that Jacob could perceive, find in our text, he could perceive that the time of his death was near. Some people will die suddenly and they'll have no clue that it was anything near. In other words, they'll perhaps be involved in some type of a tragic accident. Or perhaps I know of some who pillowed their head one night and never woke up. They didn't know that their death was near. They, they, they didn't know. They, they, they weren't able to sit everyone down and work through some things as Jacob was able to do. On the other hand, some people will perceive that my time here on this earth is, is very short. It's very limited. That's where Jacob was here in our text. Uh, he, how he knows this is not specifically clear other than the fact that he's, he's 147 years old. And, and, and again, this earthly house is decaying. It is wearing out. And as former President Adams said, the landlord has no intentions to repair in that moment in which he was facing his final days and moments here on this earth, to me it is so significant that we consider what is going through his mind, what is most important to a man when he must die. In other words, if you were to receive a phone call this week, and I pray that none of you do, but if you were to receive a phone call this week and on the other end of the line was a doctor, and that doctor were to tell you, listen, we've run some uh, tests, and we've looked at all of these things, and to the best of our knowledge and understanding, we believe that you have just a few weeks left of life to live. If you were to receive a phone call like that this week, your whole world would change, wouldn't it? And what you think is important right now as you're living life and making plans for your future and trying to figure out what's next, if you were to receive a phone call like that, if you were to receive, uh, uh, if you were to have a meeting with a doctor like that, everything would change in a moment. And the things that we, we find to be so important while we're living are not nearly as important when we look and we, we stare death in the eye. What is important to a man when he must die? I find three specific things that Jacob does during this season of his life as he's laying on his deathbed, as his time to die is, is near. He, he does three things and it reveals, I think, I think three really, really important elements in our lives when we must die. Number one, I want to say this, that who you are with is important when you must die. Who you're with is important when you must die. Look in verse 29. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. Look what he did. And he called his son Joseph. Called for Joseph. Come near to me. Be by my side. I want to see you. I want to talk to you. I want to hear your voice. Beginning here in Genesis 47 and verse number 29 and really carrying us all the way through the 49th chapter, the next two chapters, we're going to discover that Jacob is spending time and he's blessing his children and his grandchildren. It is not at all uncommon for the family to be called when someone is nearing the time when they must die. We have many extended family members. We have friends. We have business associates. We have acquaintances in this life. And there are times when a man might be tempted, sadly, they might be tempted to invest more in these relationships than they do in their own family that they live with. I've watched, I've watched as, as sometimes fam, immediate family members treat one another poorly while, 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 while showing much respect and, and, and much love and much gratitude to those that really, that really maybe are close friends or maybe business associates, they treat them a whole lot better than they do the family they live with. And I think to myself, what a shame. What a shame that we would take for granted the, the ones that God has designed to be closest to us and, 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 and we would pour ourselves and invest ourselves into those that, that, that obviously are, are, are important people God has put them in our lives, but they're certainly not the ones perhaps that are going to be gathered around you when you must die. Can I tell you that when a man knows that he's dying, he comes to the point where he must die, he usually doesn't call for his boss. He usually doesn't call for his golf partner. 
or a childhood friend. No, in that moment, a man will wish to be surrounded by his immediate family. If he has a wife, he'll want her, he'll want her near. If he has children, he'll want them near. If he has grandchildren, he'll want them near. He'll want to see them and talk to them and bless them and to be near them. Jacob called first for Joseph. I think that God allowed Jacob to raise Joseph for 17 years, according to Genesis 37. They spent 17 years together before his brothers sold him into slavery, leading Jacob to spend another 20 years concluding that Joseph was dead. But God in his mercy allowed Jacob an additional 17 years to be with his son Joseph, matching the first 17 that they had enjoyed together. This must have been a very precious gift to both of them. And understanding that history helps us to see perhaps why Jacob called for Joseph first when the time came that he must die. I want to spend as much time with you as possible because 20 years were stolen from me. 20 years were robbed from me. And so I love all of my children, but I want you. I want you to come first because you're the one that, that I lost out on all that time with. Here's a question. How, how can you best prepare for this time and ensure that those that you want to be near you will be near you then? You see, you see, there are some that have lived in such a way that when it comes for them, it's their time that they must die, the really family doesn't have a whole lot of time to give them. How can you live in such a way as to ensure that when it is your time, that your family, listen, will drop everything? Joseph, Joseph was a pretty important man. Joseph was second in command in all of the nation of Egypt, no doubt there were lots of meetings and appointments, and no doubt there were lots of responsibilities and, and lots of things that he had to do. And yet jo Joseph dropped all of it to rush to be by his father's side when he knew that it was his father's time to die. How can we ensure that our children, grandchildren, our spouse, our family will do the same when it's our time? Can I, start, can I say first of all, that I would recommend that you earn your family's favor. Earn your family's favor. Look what, look what Jacob says to Joseph. He says, if now I have found grace in thy sight. If now I have found grace in thy sight. You know, when your children are born, they will naturally, they will naturally, as they grow, they'll naturally love and adore you. I mean, you, you, you've, seen, you've seen a little boy following behind his daddy. And I mean, he's just, he just thinks his daddy's the greatest thing ever. We can go back to elementary days and perhaps remember conversations, you know, oh yeah, your dad's this, well, my dad's this. You know, my dad's the best, my dad's the greatest. So there's a, there's a natural love and adoration that young children have for their fathers and for their mothers. But you know as well as I do that something happens as they continue to age and they continue to grow. All of a sudden, that little boy who thinks at the ages of five, six, seven, and eight, his dad can do no wrong, at the ages of 13, 14, 15, he thinks his dad's nuts. Right? He literally thinks his dad has no clue about anything. Everything that his dad says is, is viewed very skeptically and, and, and very suspiciously. Where does that come from? It just happens. It's part of life as we grow and as we mature. Certainly, certainly, as you, as you live longer with someone, you do see some of their flaws, don't you? And, and you do acknowledge and recognize that every dad in this room would have to admit to their children, I am far, far from a perfect man. And uh, be careful how much you admit that because your children will, <laughs> they'll, uh, they'll, they'll affirm that very quickly, I can assure you. But something, something happens. And a child turns into someone who sort of views his father in a, in a skeptical way looks at his dad like, you know, you know, does dad really know what he's talking about? Maybe, maybe there was a season in Joseph's life when he wondered about his dad and how much his dad really cared for him. You see, Joseph was there in Egypt in his early days, and, and he, he didn't know the whole story. He didn't know that his brothers had gone back home and that they had, had taken the coat of many colors that they had personally rent in pieces and, and dipped in the blood of an animal 
and showed to their father. He didn't know that his father was laboring under this, this conception that Joseph was dead. Perhaps maybe Joseph, in those early years in Egypt, thought to himself, Dad, why didn't, why didn't you come after me? Dad, did you, did you not care? I mean, Jacob was a man of extraordinary wealth and, and, and of power and influence. And, and, and if, he, if he knew that his son had been sold to, 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 to slave traders going down into Egypt, in his mind he probably thought, Dad, why didn't you try to come rescue me? Why didn't you try to come after me? Why didn't you try to deliver me? Maybe Joseph wondered why his dad didn't try harder to protect him from his brothers and then why his dad didn't retrieve him after he had been sold. Jacob and Joseph would eventually be reunited and and perhaps it was in that moment that Joseph came to realize that his father had actually mourned for him for 20 years, assuming that he was dead. What difference does it make for me to go down into Egypt? My son is dead. There's no reason to follow after him. There's no reason to chase after him. Jacob, it seems, had earned Joseph's favor. And Joseph was eager to show him grace in his final days. But I want to ask the question here, how exactly is the, is the best way to earn your family's favor? In other words, we said, well, you need to do this, but how do you do this? Well, notice, notice Jacob gives us another clue in the same phrase. He says, if now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. I want to say this. Who is, who is near you when it's your time to die is extremely significant. And if you want your family to be near you, then earn their favor. Say, how do I do that? Well, I would say this, number two, deal kindly and truly with your family. Jacob made a request of Joseph based on the kindness and truth that he had shown him throughout his life. In other words, Jacob, I think, is saying, if I have consistently shown you kindness and truth, would you you do the same for me? Would you you show me the same type of, of honor? You know, it's amazing, as I said a moment ago, how kind we can be to absolute strangers while at the same time not showing the same type of kindness to our own family. Be kind. Be honest everywhere you go. Can I say this? Be especially kind and be especially honest in your own home. Because those people, listen, those people matter the most. When it's your time, the time in which you must die, you're not going to call for the people that we referenced earlier. No, you're going to want, you're going to want your closest, immediate family near you. How do you ensure that they'll be there? earn their favor. Well, how do you do that? I would say deal kindly and truly with them. Be as honest as you possibly can be. Be as kind as you possibly can be. So number one, we would say this, who you are with is important when you must die. But number two, can I say this, where you are going is important when you must die. Would you look in verse 29? So he says, he says, put your hand under my thigh and Deal kindly and true with me. If I found grace in your sight, would you do this? And then he says this, bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, that I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt. Jacob made Joseph swear that he would not bury him in Egypt, that he would, that he would carry him out of Egypt and bury him in Canaan. Because so many folks moved to Cleveland, Ohio, from places like West Virginia and Kentucky and Tennessee over the years, we, we have, in a, in, a, in a church like this, we have seen some who will live a significant portion of their life and they'll die here in this place, but, but they'll have their earthly remains returned to the place they were originally from. They'll want to be buried back home. Perhaps maybe there's a family cemetery or perhaps there's a, there's a plot back home where mama and daddy are and they've, they've, made, you know, they've made room for all the family to be together in our, uh, in, in our death. And, and, so, and so maybe the funeral will be here, but the body somehow, some way has to be transported back to one of those places. We're, we're familiar with that type, of, that type of concept. But I want you to know that what, what Jacob is, is stating here, what he's requesting here, is much deeper than just, I want to be near my fathers in, in my death. 
And that's certainly part of his request. But I believe there's something much, much deeper and much more significant that is happening here. Can I say that if you must die, number one, if you must die, die in faith. See, all of us must die. There's no avoiding that. And so if you're going to have to do it anyways, then do it the way that God designed it to be done. Die in faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse number 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. When Jacob stated that he did not want to be buried in Egypt, but instead he wished to be buried with his fathers in the promised land, listen, this was a statement of great faith. In other words, you know what Jacob was saying? Jacob is saying, even in death, I believe God's word. If you must die, die in faith. Die with your faith firmly fixed in the truth of the word of God. And can I just remind you here this morning that faith in God brings life. Faith in God brings life. Jesus, Jesus said it this way, whosoever believeth in me shall never die. Whosoever believeth in me shall never die. In other words, one of these days you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna read an obituary that says Peter Folger is dead. Don't believe it. Not for a second. <laughs> Don't believe it. Because if I believe in Jesus, then I'm never dying, and neither are you. Oh, you, you understand what I'm saying here. I'm saying we certainly understand there is coming a day in which the physical body dies, but do you know the real me, the most important part of me, and the most important part of you is never dying. See, you can, you, can take, you can take this body and you can destroy this body, you can kill this body, but you can never, you can never touch my soul. The devil, he can, he, he, and his, and his, his uh, people, they, uh, they, they, can, they can do a lot of damage to the body, but they can never touch your soul. You know, I've often wondered why people give so much attention to where they will be buried and they give so little attention to where they're going to spend eternity when they die. Have you ever wondered about that? Well, I, I, picked out this, I picked out this great spot right here. It overlooks this stream. <laughs> okay. We can sit there and you know, look out the window of your casket and just stare at it all day. I mean, honestly, ever stop to think about that? I don't know. I said, whatever makes you feel better is fine. Put me wherever you want to put me. I'm not going to be there anyways. And, if I, and, and I'm not going to be there long because that body one of these days is coming up out of that grave. I marvel at that, that we, that we give so much time and so much thought, and yet people, people sometimes give so little of thought to where it is that they're going to spend eternity. And I got to, listen, I got to tell you, I want to say this as respectfully as I can, what difference does it make if you're buried next to a beautiful stream if you spend eternity in a place the Bible calls a lake of fire? Think about that for just a moment. I mean, you could sit here and you can convince yourself that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be here but next to this little mountain. I'm going to be here, you know, next to this beautiful flowing stream. No, no, you're going to be somewhere else. And I'm saying, I'm saying this, listen, if you must die and we must all die, then die in faith. And faith in God brings life. God had promised to give Jacob's seed the land of Canaan. And Jacob was determined, Jacob was determined to be buried in the land that would someday be the possession of his children. God had repeated the promises that he had made to, to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, and to Jacob's father, Isaac. God had repeated those promises to Jacob, and, and, um, and, and, and he had told them, he said, I'm gonna give you, a, I'm gonna give you this land. And, and he said this, he said, I'm gonna make your seed a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. He said, I'm gonna bless all people through your seed. And he said that he would be with Jacob in this life. Jacob, listen, even, we remember this in the study, Jacob hesitated to leave the land of Canaan. You remember that? He was sort of hesitant. I don't, I don't really wanna leave this place. This is the place that God has promised to give me. Even in death, listen, even in death, Jacob believed God and his word and trusted that God would fulfill what he had said. And in other words, Jacob was dying and he was saying, take me back to the land that will someday be mine. You know, you know, what, he, you know, in essence, you know what he was doing? He was practicing sort of New Testament Christianity in, in some respects. Because you know what we do? We, we say this, we say, when I die, put me in a box, 
bury me, but don't worry about me because I'm only going to be there for a short time. You see, a lot of the world is saying, a lot of the world is saying, now wait a minute. Jesus promised to return, and yet 2,000 years have come and gone, and he hasn't returned yet. And I have to think that perhaps in Jacob's daily conversations, he would tell some people, you know this land that we're in? One of these days, this land's going to be mine. Well, who told you that? Well, God told me that. Oh, come on. Look at all the people. Look at the walled cities. Look at all the armies. You're just one man with, with, with 12 sons and, and some grandchildren. I mean, all of you added up together is only about 70 people, and God's going to give you this land. You must be crazy. And yet Jacob said, you can call me crazy all you want, but it won't shake my faith. God made a promise. You know, as I travel around the world, as I look at my life and the people that I meet, and I, tell, I warn them, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming soon. And they look at me and they say, come on. When did he make that promise? 2,000 years ago? Jesus isn't coming soon. Jesus isn't coming at all. You know what we do? We say, you know what? Put me in a, put me in a box. Bury me in the ground. Don't weep for me because I'm with the Lord. And one of these days, a trumpet is going to sound and the dead in Christ are gonna rise first. And we, which are alive and remain, are gonna be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know what we're doing? We're living by faith. Living by faith. That's what Jacob was doing. He said, don't leave me here in Egypt. Take me back to the land where God has promised to give it to me. So, but he hasn't given you that land. He, he may never give you that land, Jacob. No, he made a promise. He's going, and I want to be there. I want to be there when he does. You know what that is? That's faith. That's faith in God's word. That's believing in God. Now, how is this kind of faith developed? How is this kind of faith entered into? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you're going to have that kind of faith, then you've got to cling to the word of God and to the promises of God. That's exactly what Jacob was doing. Jacob had heard, listen, Jacob had heard with his own ears God repeat the promises that he had made to his grandfather and to his father. And Jacob clung to those promises throughout his entire life. Jacob would not let go of those promises. And you and I have the same privilege today every time we open this book to hear what God has to say to us and to believe it. Or to not believe it, the choice is yours. How is this kind of faith entered into? How is it developed? It's developed by hearing the word of God. You know, the best thing that you could have done today is come here. Best thing. You say, why? Because Cleveland Baptist Church has the greatest music in all of Cleveland. I think it's pretty good. I don't know if it's the greatest. I don't get to too many other churches here in this area, but I believe our music is powerful, but that's not why. You say, why? Because, because the preaching at Cleveland Baptist Church is the greatest in all of Cleveland. You know better than that, don't you? Here, here's why. Here's why. Because we opened this book today and we studied God's word. And every time, every time we do that, your faith has an opportunity to grow and to develop. Nothing, nothing like it. The Bible talks about heaven as a land that can be our eternal home. Jacob was looking at Canaan he says, I want you to bury me there because, because one of these days that land is going to be the home of my seed, of my children and my grandchildren. You know, the Bible talks about heaven in a similar way. The Bible says that heaven can be our eternal home if we come to the Lord in simple faith. And this faith, listen, it grows out of hearing God's word. It's in God's word that we learn the following truths. We learn that we're all sinners. The Bible's clear about that, isn't it? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's in God's word that we discover that our sin debt is very serious. Our sin debt is death. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But it's in God's word that we learn that Christ paid our sin debt by dying for us and by being buried and rising again the third day. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible is clear that he didn't stay dead. No, he proved to be victorious over sin and over death and over the devil by rising from the dead. The Bible teaches us, it's in God's word, we discover that Christ offers us the gift of eternal life. See, most world religions, a lot of people want to say, well, what's different about this group? What's different about that group? Can I just make it as simple as I possibly can? Typically, typically what's different about that group from biblical Christianity 
is this. They believe in some form of works-based salvation. I'm going to just boil it all down to that. The vast majority of, of, of churches that, that do not preach the gospel say, well, you know, what, do they, what do they do here? What do they do there? The vast majority of them, listen, here, here's the difference. They believe that you have to do something to earn eternal life. And the Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a gift. It cannot be earned. The Bible says not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. No, no, salvation is not something to be earned. It's not something to be paid for. It already has been paid for, and it was not paid for with money. It was not paid for with gold. It was not paid for with good works. It was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ that was freely shed for us. How do we know that? Where does that understanding come from? It comes by opening this book and reading it and believing in it. No, listen, that's, that's, where, that's how that kind of faith is is entered into, that kind of faith is developed. You're sitting here today, you say, I want my faith to be stronger in 2024. What must I do? Here's what you need to do. Get into this book. Read it and study it and live it and believe it, and you'll find, you'll find that your faith will grow dramatically in the next 365 days. The Bible says this, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, there may be somebody sitting here today, and you say, I'm a great sinner, And I don't know where I'm going when I die. I have good news for you. You can be saved today. You can be saved today. So what what do I have to do? You don't have to do anything. You simply have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. The work has already been done. Jesus has already done it all for you. And just as Jacob knew where he was going in death, do not leave me here. Take me to Canaan. Why? Because I believe the promises of God's word. That's why. Just as Jacob had that that certainty, so you can know where you're going when you die as well. Listen, it matters very little what your earthly address is down here. But your heavenly address, your eternal address, I should say, is of utmost importance. Do you know? Do you know where you're going when you die? Jacob knew. So don't leave me here. Carry me out. Bring my bones out of this land and take me to the land of Canaan. Why? Because that's the land God promised to give us and I'm gonna die in faith. It hasn't happened yet, but I believe it will. He died in faith. Lastly, how you will be remembered is important when you must die. Who, who's near you? That's important. Where you're going? That's really important. And thirdly, how you'll be remembered. Look in verse 30. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. See, Jacob knew all along that he was just a sojourner in Egypt living among people who did not know his God. Jacob, listen, Jacob, therefore, in death, wanted to be carried out of that land, a land that was full of people who were pagan, who were heathen, who did not know God, and he wanted to be buried in the land of his fathers as a form of identification and association with them and their faith. In other words, Jacob longed to be remembered as the son of Abraham, not a resident of Egypt. I'm a child. I'm a child of Abraham in which God has made all of these promises. By the way, if you're saved today, the Bible says you're a, you're a son or a daughter of Abraham as well. Because Abraham sets the standard of living by faith. Therefore, everyone that comes after him who puts their faith in the Lord is a child, they're a daughter, a son of Abraham as well. Jacob's heart in this is a little more clearly revealed. Go to Genesis 49, real quickly. Genesis 49, look what he says in verse 29. He repeats what he says to Joseph here in Genesis 49 and verse number 29, he says, and he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. You know, that's a great statement. All of us have a people, don't we? These are my people. These are the people that I associate with, that I identify with. You know, everybody's gonna remember it in some way. I was thinking earlier this week, my grandfather died almost 11 years ago, and, and many, many people in this church that, that have been here for a while knew him, and so you, you'll have certain memories of him. You'll me- maybe remember his enthusiasm for old cars. He liked that. People know that about him. 
Some of you remember him for his famous quotes and statements. He had a million little one-liners that he would use in, in little occasions here and there. But you know, the truth of the matter is his greatest legacy is that he remem- he's remembered for his life of faith and for his commitment to the Lord and to this church. When you die, will people remember you as a successful businessman? Will they remember you as a gifted musician, a great athlete, a brilliant mind, a really funny guy, really handy and working with your hands, or will they remember you as a faithful and godly man? That really is the goal in life. In Velauded, Spain, where Christopher Columbus died in 1506, There stands a monument commemorating the great discoverer. Perhaps the most interesting feature of this memorial is a statue of a lion destroying one of the Latin words that prior to Christopher Columbus's death had been part of Spain's motto for centuries. Before Columbus made his voyages, the Spaniards thought that they had reached the outer limits of earth. Thus, their motto was, ni plus ultra, which means no more beyond. The word in this monument that was dedicated to Christopher Columbus's memory, the word being torn away by the lion is the word knee, or we might understand it to be the word no, making it read instead of no more beyond, now it reads more beyond. Columbus had proven indeed, contrary to popular opinion in his day and age, that there was more beyond. And I just want you to know something, church family, there is more beyond this life as well. Much more. And the things of this life that are temporal are of little value when it is time that one must die. When it's your time to go, you'll want your family nearest to you. You'll want to know where you're going. By the way, that could be settled today. Ensuring that your family is near you. Listen, that can begin to grow and to be developed so that that's ensured even beginning today as you earn their favor and you deal kindly and truly with them. And then you'll want to be remembered well. That begins today as well. These objectives are achieved as we give attention to them today. So what are you you trying to say, preacher? In some respects, I'm almost trying to tell you, live like you're dying. Because all of us are. All of us are. We may not know when that time is going to come, But we do know this, it's going to come. And when it does, what is most important? What's most important is who is near. What's most important is where we're going. And finally, what's most important is how we're remembered.